Hello and welcome to another episode of the Smarter Tech Podcast. I'm here with Dr. William Pollock. Dr. Pollock, thanks so much for taking the time today. You're very, very welcome. I look forward to uh, interacting with you and uh, sharing information with your uh, audience. Tremendous. And, and um, I did a separate bio, especially in or just in the audio version. But for people listening to the video, the short version is this. Dr. Pollock is one of the foremost world class experts on PEMF, pulse electromagnetic field therapy. And there's a specific reason I did not talk about PEMF, I think a single time in my content in the last five years doing this as the EMF guy. And the reason is this, I was contacted by several companies, people who claim I'm an expert in PEMF, but all of them were associated, strongly associated, or uh, had a vested interest in one brand. And all of them told me my brand is the best, obviously, or we have the answer, we have the technology. Dr. Pollock is different in a, in a sense that when I go on his website, he recommends a vast array of different PMF products based on the usage. And this is one of the things that made me say, okay, this person has a very deep understanding of the technology where some products are good for this and some products are good for that. So uh, I had the immense chance to get introduced to Dr. Pollock and here we are with this conversation. So let's jump right in. The first thing I would want to hear from you, Dr. Pollock is how as an MD, you discovered the benefits of PEMF because I know that in more, let's say, mainstream uh, MD circles, this is still considered as something a little bit fringe uh, and mostly because I don't think they understand the science at all. So what happened in your case? How did you stumble upon this technology? Well, to go back to the fringe, it's, it's still, yes, fringy, but there is movement, there's shifting going on. And we'll yeah, get into that's that good. A bit of history uh, down the road. So as an MD, I was a medical director for a group of clinicians, doctors. I had the biggest uh, family medicine group uh, on the whole East Coast of the US. I had 14 family doctors that, uh, that I worked with, who worked for me. And um, we all shared patients in the hospital. I've explained this story many times. It had been a very short period of time. We had two admissions of uh, people, basically both of them were men, um, who had uh, gastric bleeding, had bleeding. So they were bleeding out in, in, in a colon. And one of them was extraordinarily sick. And anyway, we both of them got admitted into the hospital. We had to do the workup to find out why and discovered that the cause of their bleeding was gastric. In other words, they were bleeding from their stomach and it's going into the, into the bowels and coming out. So um, we had to figure out why. Turns out that the cause was common to both of them. It was the chronic use of ibuprofen. Oh, wow. And this is, this is after you know, 20, 25 years of practicing medicine already, or uh, about well, 20 years. And I said, well, this is, this is crazy medicine. You know, doing the same thing over and over again, hoping you don't get bad results. And for sure, in the case of these patients, it was too much, too much of one treatment for sure. It was, uh, they had reached, uh, this irritation that, that can, can that be life threatening, uh, even from ibuprofen, for example, totally, totally. Okay. Wow. Well, I had that circumstance of these two individuals and I had to ask myself the question, what are we doing? We're treating their pain with chronic ibuprofen, high dose, chronic ibuprofen. And of course, when it was known that there were, there were gastric uh, side effects from it. Yeah. And th this, this is a class of medications called non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs. And aspirin is an NSAID. So since then, uh, we have discovered that about 16,000 people a year die from gastric bleeding from NSAID use. Wow. So, my God. Uh, and that was my, my experience was two at that time at least two severe, uh, who were near death, one almost died. So I said, I got to do something different. Um, and I said, I have to go outside the house of medicine. I already knew what we could do within the house of medicine, right? What conventional medicine can do, including yeah. gastroidal anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen, Tylenol, opiates, and, and procedures. So, well, we, I need a different solution, something that 
you know, we don't have already. And I knew about acupuncture. So I said, well, I don't know anything about acupuncture, but I knew that acupuncture is used in all, all over the world, basically to treat pain. Yeah. So I, start, I did a course at UCLA uh, for clinicians, for physicians uh, in acupuncture. And I didn't go to China to learn acupuncture. I went to this special course for people who already were trained medically um, and learned acupuncture. And so at the end of my course, I started recommending acupuncture to people. And that was in 1990. So in 1990, people said, you know, no, no, no. <laughs> that the <laughs> retro. Stay with, stay with me for those needles. Exactly. Uh, so I, I started looking for ways of doing acupuncture without using needles and mm. learned that in the Orient that they were using magnets on acupuncture points, tiny little magnets, especially in Korea. They use them on the ears, they use them on the hands. Um, so you can use them on basically any acupuncture point. So then I began to ask the question, why? How is this working? What's the principle here? Uh, but we sort of understood the principles of acupuncture, but you know now we have an even better scientific understanding of what acupuncture is doing. So anyway, at the time I, I learned about the magnets, started using magnets, and lo and behold, they worked. I didn't mm. need needles. But I also discovered something else. They did something else. They were healing the tissue. When you put a needle in an acupuncture point to do things in the body that acupuncture is used for, including pain management, it's working indirectly. If you put a needle in your hand in the whole coup point, it sends stimuli up into the brain and that increases endorphins. It does other, other neuro, neurotransmitters and neurochemicals. So that dampens the pain, but doesn't heal the problem. So what, sometimes when you have a pain in your knuckle, you could treat, put a needle in there and it, it'll feel better. You put a magnet there, but not only will it help with the pain, but it will actually help the arthritis process itself. So now it was having magnets were having dual actions, the pain management as, ac, action or aspect of acupuncture and tissue action. So not, not very long after that, I actually had a bite, a spider bite on my leg. I discovered it by accident. I didn't even know I got bit. I looked down, I had an itching on my lower leg. Looked down, I had a big welt, size of a quarter. Wow. And I said, well, okay. I don't know where this came from, but it looked like a spider bite at the very beginning of a spider bite. So I got a big sized magnet, uh, which I, and I had many of them because I was exploring magnets. I had a big size magnet, taped it on that spot, and I was reading on my, uh, on my deck. So I spent two or three hours reading and looked down, gone. Wow. Wow. And that's what I said. Wow. This is impressive. So I did it right away. I did it at the very beginning of the lesion. Gotcha. And the whole lesion cell injury process had just started kicking in. And there's a concept in cell injury that says that if you can hit, hit the cell injury early on in the process before it gets irreversible injury, you can reverse it. Because it's a, it's a process, unless unless the problem is still there. If you got a, a, a nail in your leg, then you got to remove the nail, or the process will continue, right? Yeah. Well, in this case, the, pro the problem was gone. It was a bite, and the spider was gone. So uh, that worked very well. So that really intrigued me. But what's going on here? What are magnets doing? Never mind what are they doing to an acupuncture point, but what are magnets doing? And all that research then led to more expanded and extended use of magnetic field therapies and discovered all the different things they could do. The problem is I became, became frustrated because I was searching for an answer for why and how they were working. You could see the phenomena and I, I saw examples routinely of things that the magnet, magnets would do that acupuncture wasn't, do, wasn't able to do. Um, and that expanded and finally at one point I met a, a doctor from the Czech Republic, an MD PhD, who um, had got his PhD in electromagnetics or magnetic therapies. And he uh, had translated a lot of that Eastern European science. So it was in Cyrillic, it was in Russian, right? And it was published in obscure journals in Eastern Europe, the, the journals that the West never saw. Yeah. But he translated all that science and he said, I have a manuscript. So I met him and he said, I have a manuscript. And he translated it from his rough Czech into what I call Czech English. <laughs> right. And so it wasn't that wasn't that readable to, to the Western mind. 
So I worked with him. We retranslated the, the, the manuscript and produced the book called uh, Magnetic Therapy in Eastern Europe, a review of 30 years of research. So everybody should go out and buy one right now. Well, maybe not. Well, <laughs> if they're super geeks, yes, I would recommend well, I, because I, I, I did see it on Amazon and it was like, oh my God, it, it looks like something that, well, for people who want the science is, is very thorough though. It, it's pr pretty thorough, but what it does, it gave me a basis then, a scientific basis, including clinical studies, including basic science studies, basically in one place. So you can, you can, as you said, geek out and you can Google yourself crazy and find all kinds of stuff on magnetic therapy and it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. So that becomes very frustrating unless you're really, really into this technology, which clearly I was. So I published the book, started using getting magnetic systems from Eastern Europe and Europe and explored more and more and more and more. And it, I've, eventually created a website, drpollock.com. I wanted it to be a living book. It was a great idea. The problem with a website is it's not linear. You got a piece of information here. You got a piece of information there. You got a piece of information there. So you kind of have to weave together a story, uh, a linear story, if you will, on your own. So I was encouraged to publish a book. So I did. I, I, I then took, spent several years putting together a book called Power Tools for Health. How pulsed magnetic fields PEMFs help you, and that book has over 500 references. So I took a lot of the sciences from all over the place. I have a library of 30,000 abstracts of uh, effects of magnetic fields in biology, and thousands of studies, actually PDF studies. <clears throat> so that book then now becomes available, and that's what you were referencing. Yeah. Power tools for health then becomes a the basis for which you can really understand why you could and why you should use magnetic field therapies and particularly PEMF therapies. And we distinguish PEMF from magnets. So we talk about magnet therapy, you're not necessarily talking about pulse magnetic field therapy. So a magnet is a static magnet, it's made and it's, it's just sits there, it's just a magnet. You put it on your fridge, you know, put it on something metal and it'll hold, hold stuff. Uh, you could use those magnets on the body as well. Now it doesn't hold stuff on the body, but it has actions in the body that the magnetic field has. Uh, pulse magnetic fields, on the other hand, are dynamic. They're what we call time varied magnetic fields. They're in motion. A static magnet is not in motion. A pulse magnetic field is in motion. And because it's in motion, it's much more dynamic. So it interacts with the body in a more uh, active fashion than a passive magnet does. So a passive magnet interacts with the body by virtue of everything going on inside the body. So it interacts with the magnetic field of the magnet and then it produces those effects in the tissues. But a, a pulse magnetic field is much more dynamic and so and you can put it all the way through the body. You could use a, a big magnet to go all the way through the body too, but they get very heavy and they're very expensive yeah. and they're hard to come by. Actually, you could, you could do an MRI. That an MRI is essentially a whole body magnet very strong one right uh, very powerful but they're very powerful also they also cost millions of dollars yeah so i talked to a dr robert becker who used to put uh, salamanders to sleep with a magnet on the back of the head so he didn't need a big magnet to put a salamander to sleep because the salamander head's pretty small so we had a discussion in fact one time why, why can't we do this why can't we do anesthesia with magnetic field therapy instead of drugs for surgeries he said well you need a huge magnet yeah Okay, then it gets, gets prohibitively expensive. So pulse magnetic fields bypass that problem. And again, they're much more dynamic. And that's basically how I've gotten here. And now recently, I just uh, finished a, a second book, third book um, called uh, Supercharge Your Health with PEMF Therapy. And that book now gets is much more practical. So I have very little science in it. If you want the science, you go to power tools. I'm not going to repeat all those studies, right? It's, it, that was a, a tremendous amount of work to put that together. Yeah. Um, so supercharger health uh, gives you more. It's more formulaic. Say so what are the what are the different types of magnets that are available? How do you think about a magnetic system? A small one, a big one, a high intensity, a low intensity, etc. So if you got a different con a specific condition. So in Supercharger Health, I have 80 different health conditions and I describe the, the magnetic approach to dealing with those conditions and provide some supplement advice as well. 
Gotcha. Um, I want to get into the mechanisms. Uh, I'd say the at least the beginner level understanding. A lot of people in my community understand the work of uh, many researchers when it comes to the dangers of EMFs that are uncontrolled um, next to the head, for example. And these are not medical devices. It's a cell phone, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and certainly the frequencies and the signal characteristics have not been chosen for any healing purpose. Usually it's connectivity, um, uh, Really making great. sure that they don't talk with each other, so no magnetic interference between different bands and, and things like that. So we know that, for example, the calcium channels are, are involved, but uh, Dr. Martin Paul from the Washington State University also referenced uh, in many of his lectures the work of Arthur Pilla, uh, P-I-L-A, who also talks, uh, who talks about the action of calcium channels, but when it comes to healing therapies. So is it pretty much, what are the main mechanism of how PEMF can impact the human body? The way I understand it is it's pretty much the same mechanism that can cause harm, except that you're using oh. signal. No, it's not. Well, let's, let's talk about that. Yeah, sure. So EMFs, which are electromagnetic fields, I call them environmental magnetic fields. Yeah. All right. It is EMF, it's still electromagnetic, but they're environmental. And the reason I make that distinction environmental as opposed to let's say therapeutic, environmental magnetic fields are designed, as you said, for communication purposes. They're not designed, they're not, their intent is not to uh, do anything to the body, yeah. theoretically. Their intent is to communicate. What they are fundamentally is their high frequency. Number one, number two, they're broadcast. So they're what I call open loop. They're broadcast into the environment, just like radio waves and television waves and radar and, and so on. They're broadcast out into the environment. And that means that they have wavelengths. And some of those wavelengths are very long, but microwave wavelengths are smaller than a millimeter, mm -hmm. right? They're micrometer waves, essentially. And because they're micrometer, they absor are absorbed by the body. Before they have a chance to pass all the way through, they're actually absorbed. This is the basis behind a microwave oven. Okay, mm -hmm. you put something in the oven, you, you blast it with microwaves. Well, all those microwaves are being absorbed and heating whatever you put in the oven. And yes. it, ha it happens to be meat, it's gonna heat that meat. And so um, microwaves in the environment are doing the same thing. If you put a cell phone to your ear and you hold it to your ear for 15 minutes or half an hour, that ear is going to look pretty red. Typically, if you look at the opposite ear, it's not so red. It's still redder than it was normally because of reflex actions in the body, but it's, it's not as red. What you've done effectively by having the cell phone to your ear is you're cooking yourself, you're cooking your ear. Because those millimeter waves are being absorbed, they're not going that deep but they're going deep enough and they're strong enough that over time that you heat the ear. So, and in a sense, it's getting into whatever part of the brain happens to be close to that area as well. And you, to some extent, are causing some heating changes in, in the brain. That's one of the epidemiologic studies that show the people who have their cell phones to the head for hours a day on one side of the head are more likely, not always, but more likely to get cancer, uh, brain cancer on that side of the head. Yeah. Yeah, it's very uncommon, but it does happen. And most of us don't have a cell phone to our head all day long. Same thing happens with uh, Bluetooth. You should not have a Bluetooth connected to your ear constantly. I agree, yeah. Right, for the same reason. It's lower intensity, it's, but it's still microwaves. It's the sound from the speaker in the Bluetooth, but the, sound, the Bluetooth signal is still coming to that Bluetooth and being translated into a sound signal, right? Transduced into a sound signal. So, but you still have the microwaves coming there constantly. It's always on, basically. Bluetooth is always on. So that's the big distinction. EMFs are environmental magnetic fields. They're high frequency and they absorb and they cause damage because of their absorption. We actually, in medicine, we actually use high frequency fields for, for burning tissue. And we do that on purpose. We heal scars, we get rid of warts, we actually cauterize the tissue, we stop the bleeding in the tissue using high frequency. We can burn nerves. Surgeons use this all the time in the back. 
you have back pain and you identify where there's a nerve that's trapped by a disc or arthritis, you could you can't get rid of the arthritis. What do you do? You burn the nerve. Mm -hmm. So we use that in that sense. Now, PEMFs are um, closed loop. They're generated in a completely different way. Completely. So uh, um, a magnetic field is caused by uh, a current flowing through a wire. That's the basis behind concern for power lines. Is that power lines produce these large magnetic fields, but they have transients in them. And they have other problems in them that can, can potentially create issues with humans because it's not just a 50 Hertz frequency or in Europe, it's not just a 60 Hertz frequency. Yeah. So it's a, it's a whole set of frequencies going on. It's jangling. But a generator pulse electromagnetic field generated for therapeutic purposes has a very specific frequency generation. So every pulse of that frequency in that line basically causes a magnetic field. So this is called the right hand rule. The current's flowing in the direction of my thumb, and the magnetic field is perpendicular to the flow of that current. So it's a three dimensional field basically around that pop, that line, if you will. Now, the line is shielded. If it's not shielded, and I put that on my body, I'm going to burn myself. I'm going to electrocute myself. So a TENS machine, for example, is controlled electrocution. Yeah, I, I use it on my ear for um, just uh, yes. vagal nerve stimulation in my case. Exactly. And yeah. that's still electrical stim. Very different. Yeah. So a shielded wire will still produce a magnetic field because nothing stops a magnetic field. Anything that you wrap the wire with unless it's metal. If you're wrapping a wire with metal, then the magnetic field will be shielded too. Uh, but most of the time we're using uh, rubberized or other compounds, nylon, other, other compounds to shield the wire so that it doesn't come in direct contact with the skin. Then that, that, that field is closed loop. So it goes out and comes back. Every pulse goes out, comes back, goes out, comes back. It's closed loop. It always closes back down on itself. It doesn't go out into the environment. You keep going like broadcast signals are. So that's one of the reasons that it's very, very safe. A, it's very low frequency. Almost all the PEMF devices are less than a thousand hertz. And I would say probably 90% of them are less than a hundred hertz. So hertz is the expression for frequency, which is pulses per second. Mm -hmm. Yep. Microwaves are gigahertz. So there's millions and billions of pulses per second. Okay. As opposed to PEMFs, which could be five, five hertz, 10 hertz, 20 hertz, 10, 10 to 20 pulses per second, common range. So between zero and, well, it's not zero, between one and say 60 or 100. So that's, those are the main distinctions. And PEMF fields are designed for therapy. They're designed yeah. to impact the body in a way that makes the body better. And so then, then the next question becomes, what are the mechanisms? What are magnetic fields doing in the body as they pass through the body? Yeah, and before we move on, I... Yeah, I just wanted to um, make a comment towards the um, the thermal um, effect of microwave. I know a lot of people will uh, they will come back to me in the comments if I don't comment on this. The reality is uh, we do we do know the thermal effect of microwave harms for sure, and that's why the 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 ba the basis for regulations is based on thermal effects. However, I have to mention that uh, it, there's hundreds of scientists that have been arguing for decades now that the non-thermal effects need to be taken into consideration, namely the creation of excessive oxidative damage uh, in, in, in the tissue, etc. But the fact remains, I think... It, it, it can also, yeah. just like we can burn nerves with uh, these high-frequency fields, they're very high intensity. That's why you yes, burn the of course, and these kind of intensities wouldn't work on the public because you would burn yourself with your cell phone, obviously. But right. even when you don't burn yourself with your cell phone, there is good indication that it can be a carcinogen. But I think that... I, because it disrupts DNA. Yes, it does disrupt it's DNA. Break uh, apart DNA um, you know, bands and... Uh, uh, yes, and uh, for example, um, uh, the researcher I told you about at Washington State University, um, uh, Martin Paul, would say that it is indirect DNA damage via the creation of uh, certain um, uh, reactive oxygen or nitrogen species, for R example. But, it's the ROS. And, it's and, still and I think the most important distinction that you made, that is the most important, is how 
was that signal designed and what is the purpose? PEMF has been, let's say there's a basis of we've created, uh, we, we've maybe they've, I don't even know if you know the origin story of PEMF creation uh, as a technology, I don't, but yeah, that I would do. be interesting to know Tesla. how did they get started? Like Tesla. figuring out what works. Tesla. Oh, Tesla, oh, okay, wow. He was the first as far as the Tesla coil. He was the first one that discovered that if you take, if you take a, um, a a cable with current running through it, it has to go out and it has to come back. Right? Generally, that's what has to, you have to close the circuit for it to work. What Tesla discovered is that if you open the circuit, so my arm is going one direction and the other, you open the circuit in in the area where they they basically are crossing over one next to the other, going out and coming back, shielded in the same shielding. Yep. The magnetic fields cancel. That's exactly. called Lenz's law. Yep. So now if you go out and you open it up, now you're separating those fields and the wire, the whole wire is still producing the magnetic field, but now they're not interacting and canceling. So that's the, that's the genesis and the origin of the Tesla coil and the therapeutic coils we use. So almost all the magnetic systems that we have today do exactly that. They have the, the wire going out, separating out to create a coil, and then returning back to the origin you know, to create to close the circuit. Gotcha. So it's very interesting to me that uh, this is well, this dates back from from decades and decades, and yet um, it it's not widely used in in medicine. Uh, because when I read, especially, I was surprised with the amount of science in in power tools for health as far as uh, how many different conditions and applications and scientific studies have been done and not just in Eastern Europe or, or Russia and everywhere in even the world. In, even in the US, yes. And this is very, very fascinating that it hits this amount of different conditions. But the way you explain it in the book is, well, that's not that surprising considering that PEMF acts on fundamental characteristics of the human body that when you improve those fundamentals, everything gets better. Uh, so what are those fundamentals of how PMF can bring benefits to the table when you use it on the human body? Well, as you said, in the book, um, and since then I've discovered you know, a couple of other actions, and there are probably more depending on how you want to dissect it. But in the book, I talk about 25 actions. And so the principal actions, the most common actions of PEMFs um, are number one, to improve circulation. And there are lots of multi-level marketing companies that sell PEMF devices that make that claim that this yeah. is circulation. The thing is that all magnetic fields, including static magnetic fields, improve circulation because of the way the magnetic field interacts, as you said, with biology and primarily through nitric, ox nitric oxide. Gotcha. Yeah. Nitric oxide has a vasodilating effect, but nitric oxide also has a lot of immune actions as well in the body. So the, the circulation improvement is mediated through nitric oxide, which then has all kinds of other downstream uh, benefits. Increasing ATP. PMFs have been found to increase ATP by between 100 to 600%. So what can the body do with more ATP? Everything better. Everything better because every cell needs ATP. Exactly. Our body, total body produces about uh, our body weight in ATP per day. Every ATP molecule in the body is recycled between 200 to 300 or more times per day. So you make the ATP, you hydrolyze it, you release the energy, you regenerate it and do it again and just keep doing it over and over and over again. And that happens through enzymes. It turns out that PEMFs actually amplify the entire cycle. They help to make ATP, they help to hydrolyze the ATP. And you know, again, you just keep regenerating. But because the cycle of ATP is so fast, you need to be doing magnetic field therapy all day long. So you can initiate ATP production in a, in a tissue that needs help. Our body, for example, when you have inflammation, there's a flood of ATP produced in that inflammation. If you cut yourself, there's a huge amount of ATP produced in that area. Why? Because it controls inflammation, but it provides more energy for the body to do the work that it needs to do to deal with the inflammation or the injury. Gotcha. Right, so ATP is a really, critical important uh, aspect of that it um, so it uh, stimulates um, a genes turns on all kinds of genes all kinds of growth genes so if you're going to repair a wound 
you need growth factors. You need growth genes to be turned on. Right? And then those genes then cause regeneration. So one of the stories that I have, that one of my early experiences with magnetic field therapies, and I talk about this regularly because it's like stunning. Um, a little girl, three-year-old girl, tore, tore off the end of her thumb, just be, just below her thumbnail, in a door, in a door jam. Oof. Cut her off, cleanly cut her off. And so the father, right after it happened, the father called me, said, what do I do about it? He had a magnet, a magnetic system. I said, well, I heard a story, I never validated this, but I'd heard a story that in Europe, they will often resew it back on again, especially after the first first joint. So we have some residual capabilities that salamanders do. Okay, yeah. Well, they're much <laughs> more primitive sense. systems. Yeah. And they're not subject to belief and so on, which it can. That's another story by itself. So anyway, so what we did is we uh, had them reattach the thumb, got torn off, reattached it, put her on a magnet, an hour and a half to three hours a day. Literally, 12 weeks later, she's regrowing her fingernail. And was that, you, you mentioned magnet, was that a, was that a PMF system or a PMF. static magnet? It was a PMF. PMF, gotcha. Yeah. Wow. And it was a relatively low intensity PMF, but then again, you're dealing with a small area and a very shallow tissue, so you can get away with, with a level of intensity like that. Um, and then I had a, a diabetic uh, who was about to get amputated below his knees, both legs, because they were purple. Had, had almost no circulation and uh, he of course didn't want to lose his legs so he came in to see me we got him on a diet put him on supplements got him to stop smoking and stop drinking and you know what lose weight etc um, and I, I really had no hope for him I really did not expect that he would um, recover mm -hmm. we maintained very close observation because we didn't want his kidneys to shut down so what happened is that after three months, basically he went back to the surgeon and the surgeon says, oh, I guess we don't need to amputate. Incredible. So that, that's it. And it's very simple stuff, but medicine doesn't have those tools. And so they, they don't even think about this as an option. So those, are the, so those are several of the key mechanisms and that it increases collagen production, it increases uh, GAGs and hyaluronic acid in tissue so it can help with tissue healing. Um, again, tissue healing itself and tissue regeneration are key factors, growth factors I mentioned. Um, so it, it stimulates the brain. So by increasing circulation to the brain, by increasing ATP, and one of the most important aspects of PMF therapy is anti-inflammatory. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. And uh, as an overall principle, if you can at least control inflammation, it's always powerful in case of injuries, uh, especially, but even chronic pain, right, is is inflammatory in its nature, I think, from exactly. my understanding. That's one of the actions of magnetic fields. It has a natural pain killing effect. Yeah. But I don't, you know, I. it's important to be able to decrease pain, but what's more important is to heal the cause. Yeah, for sure. Because if you don't heal the cause, you'll never get off your painkillers. Right? And then there's a whole lot of other downstream stuff that happens with that. So treating the brain then becomes a very important part of this process too, because then you can alter brain waves. You can alter brain function. You can increase oxygenation in tissue, but you increase oxygenation by increasing circulation. But it's not, it's not just increasing circulation. We actually now know that magnetic fields, if you're stimulating the lungs, that the transfer of oxygen from the air into the blood vessel through the uh, lung uh, cell um, crosses that cell membrane better, locks into the red blood cell better, and then when it's released into the tissues, when the red cell goes down into the capillaries, it releases out of the red cells better into the tissues. So the whole oxygen cycle, generation and regeneration, is also significantly improved. Oh, that's interesting. And that's fundamental. More oxygenation in any body part would in my mind, um, optimize that body part, especially if there was a lack of oxygen in the first place. Especially, and um, any injury has a lack. And yeah. one of the other important actions is to decrease swelling. Every injury yeah. is accompanied okay. by swelling of the tissues. You get mitochondrial damage, you get mitochondrial uh, ATP production drops significantly after that burst <clears throat> of ATP. And then after that, you get mitochondrial damage, you get genetic uh, um, gene issues. And the body takes care of that, but the body is not that efficient. 
And whenever you have surgery, for example, you have a cut, a surgical wound. What does the surgeon do when you leave the office? Mm, pray. <laughs> okay. Cross your fingers. Because <laughs> right? the surgeon doesn't help you to heal that wound. Yeah. What you're doing is your body's healing it, and the surgeon is relying on the averages, you know, that your body's going to take care of itself. But, you know, a certain number of wounds fail. A certain number of wounds get complicated. A certain number of wounds take a lot longer to heal, especially given the underlying conditions of the body. So if you're a diabetic, you got lousy nutrition, you got lousy oxygenation, right? Then you're going to take, it's not, you're not going to heal as well. We know that kids like this three-year-old heal phenomenally well. And a 70 yeah. year old is not going to heal as well as a three year old. Yeah. Right. That's a reality. Yeah. Most people don't have the nutrient status they should have. They don't move as much as they should. They don't sleep as much as they should. So taking into consideration, probably the average adult doesn't heal as much as they should. So, you know, that's average. Yeah. Right. Average is composed of the bad and the, and the great. Yeah. Right? That's an average. So I know a plastic surgeon in Virginia Beach who won't do plastic surgery on somebody until they've been on a nutritional program for three months at least. Oh, wow. Because he's found over the years, they get much better results and they don't complain. Yeah. <laughs> right? they're, 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 they're bought in to the healing process because they control the healing. The surgeon doesn't control the healing. They control the healing. Go back, go back to chance, yeah. you cross your fingers. So what we're doing with magnetic field therapy is we're eliminating chance or we're dramatically reducing chance. Gotcha. Because so all, it's the, a, all the factors that we yeah. mentioned, you know, that it's a, it's a great support for healing. And also, um, I have to mention though, I'm, I, I don't initially need healing. I, I've been uh, dabbling with the device. Uh, you sent me the flex pulse. You're, uh, you're, you're wrong about that. Well, I, ne I need it for exercise, right? So no, I'm kind of damaging no. my body from exercise. So no, is it something that's no. something that you would use even if you don't have an injury, right? Let's explain that. Yes, please do. Ain't nobody getting out of here alive. Well, everyone's going to die at some point. Ain't nobody getting out of here alive. Yeah. Right? So... From about up to about age 24, we're basically like this. We're, the, the pen is going uphill, right? We're growing. Between 25 and 40, we're relatively static, relatively, depending on whether you play professional sports or otherwise, you know, if you're a laborer or so on, you're putting a lot more stress on your body. But between 25 and 40, hopefully, the repair and the uh, growth, the repair and, uh, and breakdown of the body are in balance. But after about age 40, most of us tend to notice a few creaks and rattles by the time we hit 40. They may, unless you got in harm's way and really did a good job on yourself, normally you're relatively stable. After age 40, that curve starts to go down. Yeah. So the question after 40 is whether it uh, basically, uh, my, this is a crazy background thing, whether it goes <laughs> down like that or whether it's a very small, gentle slope. Yeah. So you want that slope to be as, as slow as possible. So what you're doing with magnetic field therapy, because you're making everything more efficient in the body, you're making everything more balanced, you're not you're getting rid of chance, you're amplifying the, ability, the capabilities of the body. So that's why we all need it every day. Let, give, let me give you another thought. How many cells do we have in our body? Um, I don't know the exact amount. It varies depending on who you ask, but trillions. Hundreds of trillions. We have probably close to 100 trillion cells in our body. Let's assume that number, 100 okay. trillion cells in our body. It's definitely trillions. You know, you could argue possibly, uh, ha, you know, half a trillion here, half a trillion there. Yeah. Right? Well, what's a half a trillion among friends? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we have 100, let's say 100 trillion cells in our body. And any, every single cell of the body has about 2,000 biochemical processes per second. Per second. That's amazing machinery. Incredible. Yeah. And so that body has to keep all that in balance. Everything's got to be talking to everything else. Everything communicates with everything else, like morphogenetic fields and other ideas. So as a result, we need we need to amplify. We need to remove chance. And we're doing magnetic field therapy by increasing the energy production in the body, because that's the basis of action of the magnetic field. You're increasing energy production. 
The magnetic field is interacting with ion charges, the electrical electromagnetic sort of life of the body is increasing and amping up the charge in the body through a principle called Faraday's law. So Faraday's law means basically the magnetic fields are inducing charge in the tissues. The higher and the faster the magnetic field, then the more charge production in the tissue. And then that charge production, then Pilla, Arthur Pilla is a friend of mine who actually oh, okay. passed, he's passed away. Uh, but Arthur really established that, that you basically uh, increase the energy, you increase the energy, you, you increase longevity and, and the general health of the body, the general vitality. So what happens, unfortunately, is as you're going down that slope, things snowball. So one injury, if it's not dealt with immediately, snowballs to another problem, snowballs to another problem, snowballs to another problem. And pretty soon you've snowballed so much, it becomes very hard to reverse the damage. Yeah. And one of the things magnetic therapy doesn't do, I'm sorry to tell you, is it doesn't raise the dead. Yeah. So you got to go with prevention. So it's... It, early, it's treatment, early treatment and prevention are the best. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And what what is fascinating to me, I, I've read a great book on uh, red light therapy from uh, my buddy Ari Witten, who's really, uh, he's, he's an incredible researcher and, and has uh, put together this, uh, this guide um, that's widely sold on Amazon and Kindle about red light therapy. And what he says is, um, is exactly what you have explained with PMF. And we're talking about uh, hundreds of gigahertz, right? In the very high frequencies, high frequencies, red light or near infrared. And there's benefits that you mentioned that are also similar. What he mentioned, though, uh, is that there's a dose response uh, relationship that has been established when it comes to red light in the form of how many joules the that uh, uh, the the J sign that you're giving to each body part. And reading your book, I was always it was always in the back of my mind. Do we know? Do we have the science with PMF? What is the right dose? And my second question to that is: Is PMF therapy acting as a hormetic stressor, where you need? to, um, let's say, stress the body a little bit, recover, stress, recover, in which case it would mean that you would not want to do PMF therapy 24-7, but in, in, in kind of short bursts. So am I well, understanding I this even, right? Even that, even that I would argue. Okay. But, ha but as you said, it's hormetic and it's do dose response. So the primary difference between red light therapy or far infrared therapy is because there's, the frequencies are so short, it has the same problem as microwaves. It doesn't go deep, right? So it's very good superficially. Like acupuncture is generally good superficially. And so that's okay. And if I stimulate, if I stimulate uh, electrically, if I do a TENS machine, like you're doing the CES, if I do a TENS machine to my, to my uh, hand, that signal is gonna go to my brain and then basically go to my nervous system. And it's gonna have a cascading benefit through the body but it doesn't produce enough necessarily locally, enough okay. effect locally. So red light is much more superficial and it has all these secondary actions in the body, right? But it, and I, one of the reasons I, I'm so uh, involved in PEMF therapy is because I know I could treat you deep. I don't care where the problem is in the body. Okay? And I'm not just making you smile, I'm not just making you feel better, which is what we often do with, make, with uh, acupuncture, make you feel better but it doesn't do the healing. And so the same thing with red light, it can heal superficially to the extent of the depth of the um, red light or the light therapy of any kind because of the high frequencies. Um, and the same can apply to um, rife. You can present all these frequencies to the body. How, uh, how deep do they penetrate into the body? So how strong is the source of the signal? So the strength of the signal is, is critical. And this is where Faraday's law comes in. That's called DBDT, the change in intensity divided by the change in time. So the higher the pulse, the higher the peak from zero to 100, and the faster that happens, the more energy is created. As that peak goes into the body, spikes into the body, that causes the most action in the tissues. So that's a stressor. It's, it's stressing the body to react. Light is a stressor. Uh, a thought is a stressor. 
any thought is a stressor. Is is a thought electromagnetic? Um, I'm, I would tend to think it's both electromagnetic and probably something else, but I don't know uh, that science very well. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's absolutely uh, electromagnetic. Yeah. And so, yes, it, well, it could be other kinds of physics as well. I mean, quantum physics, you know, the list couldn't go on and on. Yeah. At the very least, it's electromagnetic. So, uh, and the intensity of the magnetic field, I wrote an ebook on PEMFs as energy medicine. So, if you do Qigong or you do the therapeutic touch or other healing modalities, and I've learned healing modalities in my career as well, uh, in exploring all of this stuff. And the healing modalities that they have, a, a guy named Elmer Green had something called a voltage wall. We had healers touch a wall and project their healing onto that wall. And wow. at times they could generate up to a million volts. But he discovered it was unpredictable. You can mm. do it one time and then you do it the next 10 times and you can't do it. Yeah. Right? Or you do a little bit and so on. So healers have become relatively unreliable. But what's the background? What's voltage is electromagnetic yeah right so the height the, the, the height of the voltage then determines the extent of the field going back to dbdt so uh so then the question dose response go back to that question the question is depends on what you're doing depends okay. on what the problem is depends on how much healing work has to happen so let me give you an example the dr pilla was involved in the development of a, of a device that got FDA approved, Health, Health Canada or FDA approved, uh, for healing non-union fractures. These are fractures that after six months have not healed, have knit. That's called a non-union. Mm -hmm. And what they discovered is that magnetic field therapy could initiate the healing process of a non-union fracture, even though it's been there for seven years. So, Wow. What's the dose response? So if the magnetic field intensity of one of these devices is 30 Gauss, 50 Gauss, something like that. So Gauss is a measure of magnetic field intensity, G-A-U-S-S. -S. So if it's 50 Gauss, then you may need to treat 12 hours a day. Right? If it's 100 Gauss, you may only need to treat six hours a day. And that's to heal that fracture in six months to a year. Yeah, so... I guess uh, the best thing we we have um, when it comes to PMF, the when it comes to the right dose of PMF is certain studies for certain conditions, and we can kind of look at at what has been published, and then it's uh, the experience of the physician using the machines for their patients and their their wisdom. Right. So I think my thirty years of working with magnetic field therapy. I basically come to the conclusion based on Faraday's law. So I don't care what frequency you use. Every frequency, every slope of the curve of the magnetic field, of the wave, if you will, of the, of the magnetic field, determines the energy production in the body. So if you're doing a frequency of, um, say, 10 hertz, and you're able to achieve the maximum intensity you need for that particular problem or that tissue or that physiology that you're trying to change, then that's good. Now change change the frequency. Go up ten, go up another ten hertz. Go to twenty hertz. Then what happens? The image that I use is that if you're starting at zero and you have to go to hundred, and that takes um, one second. Now if I go up to ten hertz, that's ten pulses per second. So what's going to happen? I'm going to hit that peak before I stimulate that next pulse, way down here. Right. So if I get off that ladder, if you will, too early, then you lose your DBDT. You lose the amount of energy you're going to produce. So or what I do is I have to take the engineering and say, I'm going to deliver 10 hertz. But if I'm delivering 10 hertz, then I've got to significantly increase my power to get to the top of that ladder. So the ladder, the power, the amount of energy you produce is the critical factor, not the frequency. But if you don't have the right power for the frequency you're using, then you're not going to accomplish the job. But you're going to do something. So the question is, what? how do you compensate? If you do buy yourself a PMF system that's, say, 10 hertz, but it's only one Gauss, you're going to have to treat for a long time. Okay. To be able to get the yeah. intensity. So on my website, I have a blog about adenosine. 
don't know if you read that blog. Uh, but research not. is showing that the adenosine receptor has an optimal uh, magnetic field intensity of 15 Gauss. Okay. And the curve, the curve basically goes like this. So up here is 15 Gauss. So you, you, can, you still have action going all the way up to that optimal intensity. But the, the lower that um, intensity is, it's not doing the job as well. So that means you have to do treat for a lot longer to get the same, repeat the same signal over and over and over again uh, before you, you can get the maximum intensity. So in that blog, I actually provide tables of the intensity you need to deliver 15 Gauss anywhere in the body. Oh, okay. Interesting. All right. Because we know that magnetic fields like light, sound, cold, et cetera, drop off very rapidly. It's called the inverse square law. Mm-hmm. They drop off very ra rapidly. There are other ways of measuring the loss of intensity as well, but medicine uses the inverse square law for radiation planning. So if I'm going to do, deliver radiation into the lung and I've got a lesion that's four inches into the lung, then I have to calculate the dose of the radiation to get the right dose at the lesion. Yeah, I understand. Now, unfortunately, radiation causes damage along the way. Unfortunately, magnetic field therapy doesn't. Yeah. So calculating the inverse square law then becomes part of the process. You not only need the right intensity, so then that becomes complicated. And I wrote a, a chapter in a book about dosimetry, what we call clinical dosimetry. So then how much, what's the dose? What's the strength of the field? Um, how long do you treat for? And how often do you have to repeat it? So that you can see what the results are. Um, and the higher the intensity, the shorter the treatment times, and probably the faster you're gonna attempt to get your results. Gotcha. It makes sense. It's it's even more similar than I thought to red light because they do talk about the fact that many devices are so underpowered that you will red light yourself all day, you will get zero benefits. And they said that in that sense, many red light devices sold on the market are completely useless. Maybe that's the same, the same case with PMF devices. I don't know. But there there's such thing as like the right dose where you actually get an effect. So that's important that we know what it is or else we can use devices well, all day and on, not achieve anything. what you're measuring. So okay. for example, these very low intensity whole body PMF systems that are sold through multi-level marketing companies. They're one Gauss or less. Yeah. People still feel good with them. Now, I don't know how much of that is possible because you just spent $5,000 on a machine. You're going to believe <laughs> it's going to work, right? I hope it works. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's going to work. I know it's going to work. But I know that what, because it's so superficial and so weak, that basically what it's probably doing more than anything, because not, not all these people who buy it are placeboed. Um, but what happens is it's probably stimulating the... Um, the uh, sensory receptors in the skin, A and B, it's stimulating the acupuncture points and meridians, which are, tend to be very superficial in the, in the body. So you're going to get that benefit. They're still going to provide that benefit. But if you're looking to treat a brain tumor or a concussion, it's not enough juice. Yeah. So you have to then figure out the juice. So my perspective has become, as a clinician, both as a medical doctor and as somebody who's worked with magnetic fields for the 30 years I've been working with it, is the intensity really is the most important. We can fool around with frequencies, uh, but intensity becomes the most important. So let me give you another metaphor, particularly when it comes to the brain or another way of thinking about it. If, I, if I'm whispering to you and I want to put you to sleep, okay. It's going to work. <laughs> well, yeah, well, it works subtly, maybe, okay? Now, if I'm talking to you in a conversational tone, let me quiet down a bit. If I'm talking to you in a conversational tone and I'm trying to hypnotize you, okay, you, you can go la di da, okay, or a sound outside is going to distract you. Yeah. Something or a, an, an ache or a gurgle in your in your gut will distract you. Now, if I start talking louder, right, you you can't ignore it. And then you can go really loud and you're overwhelmed. Now, there's no possibility that you can not react to it and so what happens then if you do with higher intensity magnetic fields you can always titrate up but you don't if we start low if you start with one gauss you can't go any higher so and nobody's going to put in 16 hours a day yeah right so practically speaking you need the higher intensity so that you can modulate it as you need to for the problem that you're dealing with at the time that you have available 
And you know, many of these companies are marketing like eight minutes, eight minutes or 10 minutes a day is all you need. That's kind of a cookie cutter advice that well, you, know, mm, you need what you need. Yeah. You know, you don't know whether you need eight minutes. I, yeah. That spider bite, that took three hours of treatment. These non-union fractures, nine hours a day, 12 hours a day. And they actually did a study looking at people who did less time. And they actually showed in that study how much longer it took them to heal their fractures. So, the, so in, in that sense, the body could could use more help and more help and more help for certain conditions that are, that are long standing or very hard to heal from. You mentioned the non-union non fracture has been there seven years. Obviously, the body has been trying to heal for seven years without any success whatsoever. It's stalled. It's stalled. It's stalled. Yeah. Right. So it lost balance. Basically, what we do, our bodies try to find the best balance you can find in the presence of imbalance. And so in that case, it stalled. It didn't get worse. Now, fortunately, they don't get infected. Some of them do. But then, if you, again, if you do more treatment, you're going to get more rapid benefit. But we also have to rely on the fact that the body has its own dynamics and healing. So it, the cornea, for example, heals in 24 hours. Every tissue in the body has its own cycle of regeneration. Yeah. Right? So um, skin is three weeks. Muscle is three to five weeks. Ligaments take years, if ever. Brain cells could take forever. Now we know that we could stimulate um, um, stem cells in the brain to help to heal the brain, but the brain is much more locked in as a an organ than the skin is. Um, yeah. Right. The gut heals in, in, in seventy-two hours. So depending on the tissue you're healing, you have to understand the healing cycle capabilities of that tissue. Then you need the dose. Then you need the right treatment time. You need whatever time you need. And what you do is you find out whether the time that you're putting in and the machine that you have is doing the job. And if it's not, then you probably have the wrong machine or the wrong time, or, or in the case of that plastic surgeon, you don't have the bricks and the mortar yet. You don't have the supplies in the body to do the healing work. That's a great point. So if PMF in a sense is, can only work to the extent that the body is able to do the work, right? PMF is not doing the work for the body, but it's kind of clearing the way and facilitating something that is supposed to happen uh, by itself or could could improve, could it improve the, the body's ability to, to heal beyond the normal capability in a sense? If, I, if I'm a healthy individual and normally my healing is 100%, can PMF bring me to 300% and the answer from medical studies I've seen is yes. No. Uh, no, it cannot? No. Okay. I mean, your skin is your skin. If you try to make your skin something else, it's not going to be your skin anymore. So you're limited by your body's natural ability to heal, but at least you're... But, you're, by, you're the, by the natural const, const, constitution of that tissue. Yeah, okay. Okay, in other words, you can't make the liver a super liver. Yeah, <laughs> right. you can make it an op. You could optimize the liver, but you can't make it what it isn't. What it can't. It's not capable of being. Yeah. Now you're okay. you're thinking more in terms of performance, but again, you can perform only so much. I mean, you know, with the Olympics, you, you have to. There are timing. Times are improving in the Olympics. They're constantly improving. Yeah. But they're shaving hundreds of a second. They're not shaving minutes or hours. Yeah. They're not right. turning superhuman because they use all these machines. They're not turning into someone that can lift lift a home, for example, or something crazy. They're slightly well, improving, and and it's again to the, the within the capabilities the, of that that tissue, yeah, okay, that organism in general, correct. Gotcha, and and that's being realistic about what PMF can do. But just thinking about myself, I'm I consider myself very healthy, but I know that uh, I could use. PMF on a very regular basis for uh, muscle repair, or even if I feel I, I went to the gym yesterday and my back wasn't wasn't right after squats, so I could probably use that on the back right away, right after my workout right. to, so, so to start ask, repair. I would ask you, why did your back have a problem? Positioning and muscle tear that were a little bit more extreme but, than Well, then than you're not a superhuman. Normally. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because you broke down. Yeah, I did. Right? And we all will. So that's the problem. We all do, no matter what. So if you push beyond the body's capacity to deal with what the stressor that you're putting on it, the stress you're putting on it, then it's going to say, ouch. Yep. And then it has to heal that. 
Now that the healing need may be very minimal. It may be just a matter of reducing a little bit of the edema, increasing circulation, getting rid of the lactic acid and bingo in the morning, you're fine. Let me give you yeah. an, another example uh, about magnetic field therapy. A friend of mine worked with the American Olympic teams and he'd be with, at their camp. He'd be at their tryouts and workouts and competition. And he couldn't understand why the East Germans and the Russians were back the next day like robots. So our guys took two to three days to recover. Mm -hmm. he couldn't understand this. It didn't make any sense because this is what we knew, right? Because they did what they did. They did their, their, their therapeutics afterwards. They did their nutrition afterwards. They may, may have had massage or chiropractic or whatever afterwards. But the East Germans and Russians were back like that. He went past their camp, walked past their camp. What were they doing? PMF. They were laying, they were laying in magnetic tubes. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that's not doping. No, well, exactly. It's just it's just fair game. At least it, it, at, at the moment, it still is. And I, I've heard about uh, Tour de France competitors and professional athletes that use PMF. It's very well known that uh, it will improve performance or at least with the with the number of injuries they must they must get on a frequent basis just regular training it must help them with strains and muscle tears that were oh maybe i i put a little bit too much on the squat rack today and something isn't right in my back and then maybe the next day they're fine versus normally it would take them a week and really slow down their progress so for them it's every second counts and these technologies are very useful but remember atp If you're going to do squats, you want to increase the ATP in the muscles that you're going to be using. If you do ATP, because remember, ATP doesn't last very long. So if you do the magnetic therapy before you do your squats, you'll have improved circulation to those tissues. You improved oxygenation to those tissues. You have improved, increased ATP mm -hmm. in those tissues. And you've made those tissues use the nutrition that was already in the body better. So you've gotcha. got a whole bunch of things that are now amped up. So when you do the squats, then bingo, you're much better. And with, with active sports, magnetic therapy has been found to actually show stability of the nervous system. So in other words, you, you, you don't, you'll go like this when you're, when you're stressed. They, they did accelerometers and they did uh, uh, platforms um, or stand, standing platforms, they call them. And they, act, they do those standing platforms and see how much sway there is in the body. And with magnetic field therapy, they found instead of being like this, it was like, it was like this. So more stable in Much more the body's stable. response to uh, big stressors sometimes in the gym. Whatever the stressor it. happens yeah. to be. And in this okay. case, it's sway. So it's not even that much of a stressor. It's just a balanced thing. The body has cybernetics to try to rebalance itself. Mm. But you're stabilizing that nervous system. So your, your reflexes are much faster. And so that means it's more likely in action sports, it's more likely to prevent injury. Because now you're optimized in your general functioning. Gotcha. So you, you, you've successfully convinced me that uh, I need to use that daily. Well, just because I exercise, I'm, I mean, I'm still in the range of stable regeneration and I, I hope I'm 34, but I mean, yeah, sometimes I have knee pain and the reality is I'm, I sit on a chair in the scope of my work. So right there, it, it removes years of my longevity because my body will will atrophy in that position so i'm doing all i can to combat that and we have the modern stressors to fight including electro smog including everyday stressors such as bad air quality or mold or all these things we're exposed to so this is why i use many tools also to try to combat the everyday stressor and pmf seems one of the most powerful ones that we have to our at, at our disposition if you don't do everything else is going to give you a benefit but PEMF therapy will take it to the next level. So this is really the key. It's going to take you to a whole new level. And you may find that you need less of the other stuff. Gotcha. Right? Because you're now optimizing everything that you're doing. So it's making whatever you're doing work even better than it normally would, which means that you could actually lower the dose. And we've seen this with medication with people who use PMFs. You can lower the medications because they are absorbed better to the body. You don't need the same dosing. Yeah, that's very that's very powerful, and I know that's uh, a big question. Do you do you still have a little bit of time? I know we're kind of going overboard here. Go ahead. 
Okay, uh, two things before we close. I want to hear about electrosensitive individuals. I know that uh, I'm going to read a quote from uh, Dr. Havis uh, and then uh, let you comment on it. And the second thing, maybe just talk about the FlexPulse, which is the device I've been uh, trying for myself and that I think would be a great introduction to the world of PMF. So just keeping these two thoughts aside. Starting with uh, Dr. Havas, uh, Magda Havas from, from Canada. Yeah, who's, she's a friend uh, of mine and we've Oh, perfect. So you, you're Canada aware of uh, Dr. Havas and uh, most people will will be, if they're listening to that channel, have been studying EMF for, for quite a, a while. She's one of the top authorities on Absolutely. EMFs and also knows PMF and many uh, frequency-based healing modalities very well. So she uh, says she, this. She uses, she uses PMFs for her own healing. Well, it, exactly, and she's one of the only EMF uh, scientists that has been openly talking about the benefits of the frequency-based technology. So I find that she's very well-rounded in her understanding of both sides, the harmful effects and the beneficial effects. And sometimes I feel like the messaging around EMF is, oh, all EMFs are bad, 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 bad. But then I go home, I use red light therapy, and now I'm starting to use PMF and I see benefits and I'm like, hmm, is that really serving people to fear all EMFs? And the answer is no. Uh, it's unlogical because if we feared all uh, EMFs, I would never get in the sun because the sun is high frequency and high intensity. So and what gives, radiation. right? That's, That's radiation. Oh, I'm radiating myself. But the reality is we, we need sunshine. We need the many types of frequencies. And in balance. In balance. So Dr. Hava said about the electrically sensitive, she said uh, some people who are electrically sensitive are unable to use the devices, the PMF devices, but others seem to do quite well. And the reason for this is not known and requires further studies. That was several years ago. Um, what are your comments about electrosensitive individuals and are they able to use PMF devices or no? Or is it very situational? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that I deal with those people regularly. Uh, by the way, Dr. Havis, when I first started lecturing and she was on stage often with me, uh, she almost never said anything positive about PMFs. <laughs> but as she started, she started hearing me talking about the benefits of PMFs, she began to change and, and recognize that there was another world related to magnetic fields yeah, yeah. that you shouldn't ignore. So electrosensitivity is, uh, I think it's a complex process. It's a pro complex problem. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it's hugely tied into psychology and the mental state of the person. They did studies where they exposed people to um, magnetic fields and they... Uh, had people not exposed to magnetic fields and they randomized them. And so people didn't even know whether they were exposed or not. But when they were told they were exposed, even though they weren't, they said they reacted. Yeah, I, I've heard about these studies. I know some people will not like your comments, but I'm, I'm I, 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 that, that, in the sense that that's, the that's science, science. Yeah, the science around these these studies, um, many researchers, including uh, Darius Lysinski, who's really esteemed in, in as an EMF scientist, have commented that these studies, let's say he was not satisfied with the study design and said, uh, this is probably not a good indication whether electrosensitivity is a physical or psycho psychological process. How I can I did, comment? I didn't, I didn't say it's either or. Uh, yeah, it's probably, I, I, I would tend to think it's probably both. Personally. Well, well, but I, knowing, his, knowing people and their processes and their reaction to illness and the reaction to disease, yeah, even the reactions to pain. So I have, I'm um, working on another book coming someday uh, called the Pro Chronic Pain Brain. So once you've been, once you're in chronic pain, it changes your brain. I mean, yeah. it, it actually physically changes your brain, and so now you become sensitized to anything. It's called allodynia. So even just touching the hairs on the back of your hand causes a signal of creation in the brain that says, ouch. It is not ouch. It's just a touching the hair. Yeah. Right. So what happens is there's a sensitization process physically, but at the same time, you can't separate your mind and your emotions from what your body is feeling. I agree. And so they begin to cascade and go together because I know people who will not, um, who are, like with fibromyalgia, for example, there are people who will not accept anything, any change, positive or negative in their life. 
Yeah, they're kind of stuck in the in this place. They're stuck in a fight flight mode. Yeah, yeah. Because anything, even positive, is going to require a change. It's going to require a reaction. And because they're because of where they've gotten to in their evolution of their their problem, their health challenges, um, everything could upset the cart. So they're in the best balance they could find in the presence of imbalance. Yeah. Right. And so as a result, it's a threat. So if you're told that you're being exposed to PMF therapy or to PMF fields, automatically your sensors go up. Automatically your flight fight response goes up. And then a whiff, a waft of air coming across your face while this is happening, then becomes interpreted as a threat. That was you're saying, aha, yes, yeah, see, it, it threatened me. So, so the psychology is part of it, but it's not just psychology, it's also physical. I don't, there's no doubt about it that it's physical. I yeah, think sure, hypersensitivity, yeah. electro hypersensitivity is much more related to um, chronic inflammation in the body, an inflamed nervous system, uh, and generally, in general, a body that's toxic, whether it's from infections or environmental toxins or uh, heavy metals or uh, even EBV, Epstein Barr mm -hmm. virus, which 90% of the population has. So chronic viruses in our bodies, we're loaded with them. I routinely used to test people for virus, routinely did about five different viruses. And it is rare that I saw a person with only one virus. And that's usually, and usually it was EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. But most people had two or three antibodies. And these viruses that I tested for are known to be what we call stealth viruses. They hide out in the body. Yeah. So what are they doing in the body? They're doing whatever they want. Yeah. <laughs> Opportunistic. I, I know I'm, oh, I have totally Epsin, Epsin bar and mycoplasma um, antibodies and I've been uh, my functional medicine doctor told me that your viral load is very important and it's and it's chronic and it's let's say hidden from your immune system. So that's my case. And that's it right. really it helped me. It becomes intracellular just like yeah. Lyme disease becomes intracellular and it can reactivate and come back out and then, you know, do whatever it wants essentially exactly yeah so yeah so i think hypersensitivity people who have hypersensitivity can use magnetic field therapy it depends on the severity so there are people i know that i could not do any kind of magnetic field therapy with with them at all in fact i would use magnetized magnetically treated water okay mm. right and then they would have to gradually increase the magnetically uh treated water and see if they could tolerate that uh, but it's not the water, it's not the magnetic fields that are affecting the, them when they're drinking magnetically treated water. It's the water and the structure of the water that's affecting them. Mm -hmm. uh, quantum physics may say, well, the, the magnetic fields are still there. Uh, well, I'm not going to argue with that. I'm not a quantum <laughs> physicist, right? Yeah. But the point is that you can, and you can't, somebody with hypersensitivity has to heal. You have to heal the tissue. And it may be an extremely slow process. And you have to have, you have, to have uh, faith, in a sense, that this is not going to harm you. So one of the key elements to mention about pulse magnetic fields in general is that the magnetic field therapy doesn't cause problems. It reveals problems. OK. So, and this is those situations you mentioned in your book, 1 to 5% of um, of temporary adverse reactions when people first start the treatment in the sense that it could reveal, it could ma make a tissue inflamed because it, it now, the let's say the body has almost ignored that body part for a while, but now you kind of, it, it brings back that problem to the table. So there's already inflammation there. And then what you're doing with magnetic field therapy is you're increasing the amount of circulation into that tissue. And when we increase circulation of tissue, we increase oxidative stress. It's natural. You yeah. create o oxygen species. You have to, every breath you take creates oxygen stress in the body. Mm -hmm. So you can't avoid that. So, but you have to try to control it so that you don't overstimulate the tissue. This is one of the reasons I prefer pulsed, the pulse machines rather than the frequency machines. So people, people with um, extreme hypersensitivity need to avoid frequencies. And many people go out into the frequency zones, frequency free zones around the country, the US, so that they're not bombarded with these frequencies. I find this routinely that people who have the frequency systems are irritated. And when they go to the pulse systems, they're not. 
What's the difference between these two types of systems? Do you have an example when you say a frequency system, that would be something where there's no pulsing? Well, for example, the, um, the flex pulse, next topic. Okay. And the flex pulse is a frequency system. Okay. So it's producing a frequency, specific frequency. Now, there are other frequency systems that are, um, have multiple frequencies in them. So one of the frequency systems that I use a lot uh, is called um, the biobalance. Okay. It's a 10 Gauss magnetic system. It's not that strong, right? But it's got built-in frequencies. And so when you present the body with a lot of frequencies at the same time, the body's trying to figure out what it's going to react to. And so you react to one frequency and you don't get time to sort of unreact from that frequency before you hit with the next frequency and the next frequency and the next frequency. It's just way too much information in the body. But if you're like this, right, you can see, you can sense that this is not going to be as, as required as much of a response from the body. So if your nervous system is already on fire, it's already hyper excitable, your brain is hyper excitable, then this becomes way too much. Okay. So a simple signal, simple, easy signal is, you know, you, you can accept that. And then you gradually increase the dose to their tolerance. So if I understand correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, you recommend systems that would use one single frequency with pulsation rather right. than a switch between different frequencies for these individuals. Yes, for that reason. So the flex gotcha. pulse actually works very well for this because we worked with the manufacturer in Germany to design the flex pulse to present just single frequencies at a time. Because then, then you're eliminating a lot of variation. Gotcha. So if you do uh, program one, you're going to get three hertz. That's all you're going to get. And it's battery operated, so there's no risk of uh, pollution getting into the equipment. Uh, so basically, then you can figure out whether you can tolerate that. Then you, it's easier then for you to figure out, let's increase the dose and find out whether you can tolerate the dose. So then it becomes a question of the treatment time and then a question of the dose. Yeah. And again, most people tolerate that better, but you still have to deal with the fact that, yes, you're going to flood the tissue with circulation. You may, it may create discomfort temporarily, but you need that discomfort. You have to climb the hill to get to the other side. Yeah. And you're going to huff and puff. Yeah. And when it comes to electro uh, sensitivity, you're exactly right that when I talk to doctors who treat electrically um, sensitive patients, they, they talk about the fact that it, it's difficult to um, make their patients confident in the process that we're going to have to go in the discomfort zone a little bit. And it's only natural in order to build up resilience. I've seen these people with zero resilience to whatever they go to the grocery store and then they're almost bedridden for yeah, a week yeah, okay, because yeah. it it was overwhelming and the buzzing of lights they're light sensitive sound sensitive chemically sensitive so at one point you're gonna have to get out of this rut and out of this downward spiral but it will require to go back in a slightly symptomatic zone sometimes to go a little bit over what is your and, current and, and, comfort and zone do it in a controlled fashion Yes. Yes. And that's why that's why the single pulse systems probably would generally do a much better job for that for that setting. Gotcha. Uh, again, people have to remember with hypersensitivity, you have to remember magnetic fields do not cause harm. The magnetic field does not stay in the body. It's the body's reaction to it. So it's the body that's causing the harm, not the magnetic field. And so you, you just have to deal with the stress, the, the reaction that the body has to have to that stimulus. But it's not like a drug. It's not like food. It stays in the body till the body eliminates it. So magnetic field just passes right on through. It's done and gone. Yeah. But the reaction can go on for a while. And and it's it's up to the individual with a practitioner if they have one and they should have one. But if if they're self navigating to find their tolerance level and also as you mentioned, if I have a specific injury and I try PMF and it doesn't seem to speed up healing, then maybe I need to ramp up the dose to find something that works. I guess so. It's a little bit self experimenting, but also with the flex pulse, I know what's included in there is uh, a user manual that does talk about different set of frequencies and programs that, um, let's say, are backed by research to do certain things. So there's also, you can navigate in, in, these, in these different types of treatment protocols, if you will, because the science behind it is, is at least partially there. Like there's examples where it worked for certain conditions. So one of the problems with the science 
that I have a master's degree in clinical epidemiology, so I have some training in doing research. Um, most of the time in magnetic field therapy, there are no protocols and standards. Why? Okay. A friend of mine, Dr. Bob Dennis, says there are probably two billion variables. I don't know, I, I'm raising that number. It's a huge number. When you take when you take the characteristics of the magnetic fields, there are yeah. probably yeah. about two billion variables in designing magnetic research. And so it's very hard, even the same machine, same specs produced by a different engineer is a different machine. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Right? Yeah. Because even the specs could be the same, but this happens in research all the time. It depends on the sunlight, it depends on the water content, it depends on the humidity. So no, no two labs are exactly the same. Yeah. And then on top of that, almost nobody does comparison studies. You know, nobody will do a study like you say, 10, let's say three hertz or five hertz or 10 hertz, right? Then the sh signal shape, signal characteristics are important. Then where do people start with their treatment? At what point in their healing process are they? What are they doing nutritionally? What other factors do they have going on in their lives that contribute to the symptoms that you're measuring, you know, et cetera. And you rarely compare 10 hertz against 15 hertz against 20 hertz against yeah. 50 hertz. And then I also vary the intensities at the same time. So then again, it, you have no choice essentially, but to do it for yourself, knowing that there is essentially, the research is, is essentially saying there's no harm. Even MRIs and an MRI magnetic field is Tesla. It's two Tesla, four Tesla. So 20,000 Gauss, 40,000 Gauss are done on millions and millions of people. So except for having tattoos or having metal in your body that the powerful magnet can do something with, they're, they're, they've been found to be extraordinarily safe. So it's very hard to do harm. And that's why I've come up with a principle, magnetic field therapy doesn't cause problems, it reveals problems. Okay, so the, the safety limit is, is very, very high. It, it uh, reminds me of, um, for example, molecular hydrogen where we, um, they they are they are using that type of uh, of hydrogen inhalation for people who go deep sea uh, diving, and the the supplement molecular hydrogen tablets would be the equivalent of a mere fraction a thousandth of what these people are getting. So we can conclude that the pills or the tablets in supplementation form in oral form is extremely safe because we already have. Mi millions yeah, of people a, who have taken much, much these these much higher doses so it's 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 the equivalent and i i, I can appreciate that uh, and i guess the long term effects you mentioned in your book there are some limitations to okay well what about using magnetic fields every day for an entire lifetime but as a, as an overall principle i i consider these technologies much safer, billions of times safer than cell phones, just because they're studied as therapeutics, used as therapeutics, designed as therapeutics against cell phones that are designed for, for the other other for purpose. another purpose. It, it's simply random frequencies and and random modulation schemes, and for sure the waveforms are are never harmonious. They're always extremely erratic. And many researchers in the EMF space say the reason that EMFs are so harmful when it comes to cell phone exposure, for example, is that variability between between one one pulse to another, which makes it extremely confusing and chaotic to the human body. If you take technologies that try to do something harmonious to the body and then you have this amount of data behind the technology for different conditions, then for me it's a given that there's something there and the safety profile is very, very good, at least. That's that's what well, I got I, from I, your we book. Have, and... we, have, we have other technology that's been developed and FDA approved to treat the brain for treatment-resistant depression called RTMS. Rapid, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. And a lot of the devices that I use, including the FlexPulse, we do use to the brain because we know from the safety data on RTMS, it's amazingly safe. And even with a, one of the risk factors is seizures, they're extraordinarily rare. And usually it's because somebody's already kindling a seizure. They're going to have it anyway. Okay. They just happen to be a, in an RTMS machine at the time that they decided to have a seizure. So 
even these high intensity magnetic fields are they they're used to the brain where what they do is they actually put the coil over the motor cortex and they simulate muscle contraction in a finger say well that's called the motor threshold they take that motor threshold and say okay we're going to go up 10 percent or 20 percent above that threshold and stimulate the left forehead and that's where they treat your depression so they're going up at very high levels with almost no risk Gotcha. Yeah, it, 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 ma it makes a lot of sense to me. And the the best research we have on cell phones shows it's 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 a lot of hours every day for decades leading to glioblastomas, for example. And there's still debate among scientists about what the, is the extent of the damage. But it, there's there's a my conclusion is there's a tremendous difference of having a cell phone on your head versus a PMF device. These are two completely different beasts. And um, I, I think we should bridge the two eventually. A lot of people have told me that, well, why, one do, why, why aren't they uh, studying uh, the microwave technologies and, and making the signals a little bit more harmonious so that way there will be uh, fewer biological effects? And the answer is, well, there would be an, a, an, an admission of harm. <laughs> Follow the money trail. It's just this is not their priority, right? So eventually, I think it, we're, we're going to make them safer. But anyhow, um, you have... A special offer for the flex polls for people listening to this podcast for the next month or so. So if you're just listening to this new episode, there is uh, a 20 percent of the flex polls. That's very generous, and thank you for that. That's at flexpolls.com, and you can use the coupon code EMF guy for 20 percent, and it's going to be also in the show notes and also underneath the video. Um, is there anything we did not mention, uh, Dr. Pollock? Maybe uh, your your website uh, mention your resources your books, anything that uh, is coming up that where people can uh, find you and follow you and learn from you? Um, well, drpollock.com is probably the most important. Um, we are, as I said, we have this new book called Supercharge Your Health with PEMFs, and we're going to be offering a, when you buy that course, you come under our, our landing page, which we'll, we have just recently just sent out a, a, a newsletter for this. Uh, but if you go to drpollock.com, you can sign up for the newsletter. If you buy the book on the web, if you click on the uh, drpollock.com, the book, Supercharge Your Health, it'll take you over to um, Amazon. You make your purchase, whether you get a soft cover or an, um, a Kindle, and then you come back to the page that took you over to Amazon, the Supercharge Your Health um, with PMF therapy, then you can get access, you get a code, and you get access to a three-hour course. Oh, tremendous. Very nice. That's so it's a course it. about specifically how to use a PMF devices? Well, it's a course that basically is complementing the book. Okay, great. So there are things in the course that are not in the book, but they kind of work together. But it, for people who prefer to have it said versus gotcha. read, right, then the course is another piece of but another tool to add to that information. So that's number one. Number two is we do offer consultations. Okay. But... There are a lot of people who are not going to cross the road and spend 25 cents to save their lives. Right? If you're interested in magnetic field therapy for your problems and you're you're going to be willing to spend at least three to four thousand dollars to solve your problem, then you can go to there's a consultation tab on drpollock.com on the right side. Click on that, it'll open up a questionnaire for you. And basically you're applying to have a consultation. So we have gotcha. three doctors that I work with, myself and two other doctors uh, who do the consultations. And we will take your history, we'll have the questionnaire completed, and then we'll look at what, uh, what you would be best off with. You know, what, what equipment is gonna work the best for you? Uh, we are not consultants. If you have other people, other equipment from other people, we're not gonna help you, I'm sorry. We're too busy helping those who wanna work with us. Yeah, gotcha. Right? So, but yeah, so consultations are another important aspect of what we can do. And the Flex Pulse, so let's talk a little bit about the Flex Pulse. The sure. benefit of the Flex Pulse, it's battery operated, portable, rechargeable system. Mm -hmm. It has 10 programs in it, which are basic single frequency programs, except for one, two, two programs that are not, but the rest of them are single frequency. And the manual says that if you want to learn more about the Flex Pulse, the best place to go to learn more about the Flex Pulse uh, is flexpulse.com. The information on drpollock.com is limited relative to the devices because our friendly government. 
<laughs> so yeah, uh, you, read, you can read more about it on flexpulse.com. If you want to get the coupon code, you're going to have to go back to drpollock.com and check out the flexpulse there with the coupon code. Okay, gotcha. With the coupon code EMF guy, perfect for twenty percent. So that's that's quite a, a great rebate right there. And the investment is, uh, I think it will come around a thousand dollars. So uh, among devices, it is very affordable as an introductory PMF device. And I know that with your consultation services, uh, maybe it would be better suited for people with specific conditions. And there are systems that are way more robust and, and powerful we, than the flex pulse it's, it's going to be very rare that we would recommend a p uh, a flex pulse for people who have consultations gotcha that's why i mentioned you have to be ready to get you want the right equipment for your problem there's a good chance you're going to have to be spending three three thousand plus dollars gotcha right because otherwise then you're not going to get the benefits you want you'll be frustrated and we hear this all the time well magnetic therapy doesn't work <laughs> Yeah. Well, you didn't buy the right machine, you didn't use it the right way, and you know you didn't do the other things that you have to do to be healthy, etc. Gotcha. But the flex, so the flex pulse still as an introductory devices for performance, people in good health that want an extra for edge. Sleep for relaxation, for, sleep. for brain fog, for treating aches and pains in different gotcha. parts of the body. So there's many, many uses. It's a, it's a basically a Swiss Army knife tool. That's, that's what, great and 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 also easy to travel with i'm gonna travel probably the the next entire year starting in july and this, it is that big it it probably weighs with the equipment and everything like a pound or something it is well, extremely less small less than that less than that so that's impressive for a device and i have many devices in my suitcase usually more devices than than i have uh, uh clothing because i'm kind of a health geek as you can tell but um yeah i love devices that are portable and rechargeable for that reason where i know that i'm gonna, gonna be able to have that travel companion with me all year long so that's very satisfying as well and we'll provide your support you know you can contact us back if you have any support questions uh, there's a, I think it's a two year warranty on the equipment. Oh, very nice. It's made Perfect. in Germany. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. This is, this has been, uh, to me an, an incredible podcast to introduce myself to PMF and kind of, I had so many questions and, and I still have more. And if you're willing to do a part two interview, it would be tremendous. I know you also have, uh, you also put together summits around PMF and other things. So uh, I'll make sure to link everything that you've got going on because I think that uh, the way you talk about PMF is, uh, is, is great and it's easy to understand also. And you're a pioneer in this field and I really appreciate your work for that. I'm glad that you're doing this work and uh, making it easy for consumers to understand PMF now. And there's barely anyone else in the world that I know of that have spent this time, or I, I think no one has spent this time looking at all the devices and all the science and reading your book. I was very impressed and very grateful for the work and the number of hours you might have put in uh, to, towards this work. Years. Years. 30 years. Ex exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much, Dr. Pollock, and uh, I Thank hope we can uh, chat again. I'm sure we will. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of your day.